It's a familiar passage. It's stirring. It's convicting. It's honest. There's so many things here that are found for us to read and observe as here Jesus, following the resurrection, beckons those who are his to come to him, to follow him. We'll read at verse 15 to the end. This is our subject matter this morning. So when they'd eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will guide you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, Follow me. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper, and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you. Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, But Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, If I will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Then this saying went among the brethren that his disciples would not die. Yet Jesus didn't say to him that he would not die, but if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things. And we know that this testimony is true. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which, if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. Let's pray, shall we? Well, this morning as we come again, we've gathered, Lord, in your name and we've come again to look into the perfect law of liberty, into your word. We pray, Lord, that we would have hearts that are open. We would have ears ready to hear. We would have wills that would be ready to apply your word to our life, to make perfect your way in us. Lord, I pray that you would help me. Just the man, sinful man at that. I pray, Lord, you would take that which is yours. You would take that which is lovely. You would reveal your son afresh to us this morning that we may know you. Bless the Lord. Do you love me more than these? John wrote the book, but he's not the main character of the book of John. Simon Peter is often mentioned 
but he plays only a supporting role. The other disciples and the women, and Nicodemus and Joseph and others, they're all spoken of, but they all play only minor parts. Jesus Christ is the central figure in the gospel, in this particular gospel, even as he is the central figure throughout all the Bible. John accounts to us how Jesus laid aside his royal robes and came into the world as the poorest of poor. We witnessed his marvellous miracles through the pages of Scripture. Listen to his stirring sermons and we have watched his sinless life as we read through these spirit-breathed pages. We see him suffer in Gethsemane and at the hands of his enemies. We see him die upon a cross. We have seen him burst the bonds of death and come back to life again. We see him frequently appearing to his disciples. Now, the time has come for him to ascend to his Father. His work here is done. He will go back to wait until the hour which has been set for him is time to return again. In the beginning of chapter 21, we see him there by the seashore in the early morning, dining with his disciples, having fellowship with them. As we come back to the scene, we see him dealing with his disciples, chiefly one disciple, Simon Peter, and sending him out to serve him until the end of his days. But Jesus is talking not only to Peter, he is talking to every Christian. He is talking to you and to me. In these verses, we see four things. I'd like to bring them to your attention this morning. The dialogue, the death, the duty, and the destiny. Firstly, this morning, let's look at the dialogue. I'm speaking of the dialogue between Jesus and Peter, that which we've read just now this morning. We read that after they had dined, Jesus began a conversation with Peter. You know, that's the best time often to have a conversation that needs thought and consideration. It's the right at the end of the meal. The, the apostles were at ease and prepared to give close attention to everything Jesus had to say. Jesus now puts the question straight to Peter's heart in verse 15. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Question. Didn't Jesus know whether Peter loved him or not? Of course the Lord did. He knew his heart. He knows the depths of every heart. The Lord needed to bring this confession out into the open. The Lord needed to remind Peter of his future duty. Jesus is the wisdom. Jesus, in his wisdom, helped Peter declare his love publicly so that Jesus could then publicly assign Peter's life's work. The question that arrested Peter was... Do you agape me? Do you love in the way that Christ demonstrated his love? God's love. The word here, love, is not just any love. Remember, there's four renderings of love that we find in the scriptures. Love can be rendered Agape, God's love, that which he has towards men. I would say the next highest love is, for me personally, storge. That which a parent has for their family, their children. Next, in my opinion, would be, hesitantly maybe, filio, brotherly love that which we have companionship one with another, 
And the last one, eros, where we have sensual love, love between a husband and wife that pertains to procreation and all the factors of friendship and a kinship and an intimacy within the confines of marriage. They are the four aspects. And here, the Lord is asking Peter, do you agape me? Will you love in the way that I love? Unconditional, without reservation, without wavering, without deviation. Perfect love. In perfect love, there's no fear. We want to be witnesses for Christ. In being a witness for Christ, we so often become closed up in our hearts that we won't share the gospel because of fear. Friends, we don't pray for less fear. We pray for perfect love. Love for our friends, love for our family, love that goes beyond us. This love, God's love, the love that drew salvation down to man. Christ became flesh and dwelt among us. That is the love that is to be displayed. That is the love that is to be prayed for. Peter was arrested by, do you love me? Do you agape me more than these? This idea has multiple applications for Peter and even for us. Do you love me more than these? For instance, do you love me more than these, the other disciples, your friends around you? Are you willing to leave them and follow me alone? Or was Jesus meaning, do you agape or love me more than those boats and nets and fishing? Gentlemen, I think that's a pretty hard one, isn't it? Also, do you love me more than this place where you have grown up? Grown up with your family, with your friends, and you have built your life on the toil of your hands? The comfort of what you can achieve, what you are most comfortable doing and being. Do you love me more than these? Are you willing to give it all up and devote your life to preaching the gospel? Because we find that is the working of what the Lord is asking. Or he may have meant, do you love me more than these other disciples of mine? Do you love me more than the way they love you? We are so easy to compare ourselves to someone else. I love the Lord, or I, I do this better than someone else, or I show that I love the Lord better than that person. How crippling that is. How wrong that is. That we would try and place ourselves in ascendancy over someone else. There had been a day when Peter had said, Though all men forsake you, yet will I not forsake you. He had been so confident then. But later he openly denied Christ. So maybe Jesus was saying, After all that has happened, do you think that your heart is better than the heart of of others. I believe that Christ meant this last view. Peter needed to know that this strong headedness and boasting has been sinful. He needed to feel that his heart that he he needed to, he needed to feel in his heart 
that he was just a poor, weak sinner after all. He needed to become more humble if he was going to become a faithful and fruitful servant. Don't we all need the lesson of humility? It's so evident this morning in just our worship, the songs that were chosen to an extent, but the songs that came from the congregation this morning. Prayers. We love him. We love him. Humility was spoken of this morning. The secret of success of God's greatest men has been right in this area. They were willing to give God the glory for what they did themselves. I remember, I do have a, you know, favourite biographies that I read and C.T. Studd always comes up high on my list. Man who had great wealth, but he gave it all away serve the Lord. And there's a quote that I often remember and recall. There's two quotes that I use. If Christ be God and died for me, nothing that I can do for him can be too great. The one in question is, I was just waiting for it to come to my mind. That's why I said the previous one. (laughs) I've forgotten it. Bear with me. I'll remember it in a moment. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. I heard an interesting take on that though. Because we can labour and achieve and say we're doing everything for the Lord. In the last day there will be the sheep and the goats, those who actually say they've done everything in Christ's name, but he'll say, depart from me because I never knew you. So there's got to be something more than that even in this wonderful quote. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what Christ does through me will last. That means sacrifice of our lives. That means Hebrews 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to what? Present ourselves. A living sacrifice, never moving from the altar, never wriggling off, staying, pla- staying put, staying there. Jesus' question was very simple. Do you love me? But it was very searching. The secret of all true service lies right here. We may know much and do much and talk much and work much and give much and make a great show of our religion. Yet if we do not love Christ, our religion is nothing. Our religion is just that. Religion, worthless, lifeless. Do you love Christ? That's the great question. Not do you love the preacher or the church or singing, but do you have a real love for Jesus Christ? If not, Your religion is just sounding brass and tinkling cymbals because it is without love. There is no life where there is no love. I know people who are very active for themselves, but they don't seem to know the meaning of love. Listen to Peter's answers. Yes, Lord. You know that I can befriend you. That is the terminology that Peter uses. 
filio. You know that I love you. You know that I am your friend, Lord. Then Jesus said, all right, Peter, if you love me, feed my lambs. How could Peter feed the lambs of Christ? Simply by giving them the precious food of God's word. In other words, he was to preach the pure gospel of Christ, which is indeed the bread of life for starving souls. By lambs, he must, mean, must have meant that the least and the weakest in the flock. The preacher is to feed them. And he can't do it by preaching over their heads. They must have the pure milk of the word before they can digest the meat of the word. Again, Jesus came back with the same question. Do you, agape, love me? Peter responds, yes, Lord. You know I filio you. You know I love you. This time Jesus responds, feed my sheep. The word feed in the authorised version here is translated from the Greek, Greek word poi mei ino, to tend. New King James already translates it, tend my sheep. To tend as a shepherd, to feed, to rule, to nurture, to guard, to protect, to ensure the safety of, to ensure the well-being of. First Peter was to feed the sheep on the word of God. Then he was to nurture, tend, disciple and discipline and develop them. The sheep are more able to take all of this than the lambs. So in the church, the newer and the weaker Christians are fed. Then as they grow, they eat stronger food and develop into stronger Christians displaying godly Christian character. For the third time, Jesus asked, Do you love me? And this is so very intriguing. The Lord calls on Peter one last time and asks the same level, at and asks, Peter at the same level. Peter's now maintained through this revelation of his own heart the same response. You know I filio you. You know that I love you, that I befriend you, that you are my friend. I can call you a friend. I can't claim to have agape because I've denied you thrice. The revelation of his own heart, the status of his life is seen for what it is. Peter now begins to understand where he stands before the Lord. You see, Peter has denied Christ three times before the cockerel crowed twice. And now he has been called upon three times to confess the love of Christ. We are told that Peter was grieved because Jesus asked him this question the third time. But it was, but it, but it is what Jesus asked him that grieved him. It is this coming down to his level. I understand you, Peter. I believe you've taken the depths of where you really lie, that you're not better than anyone else. Your heart isn't greater than anyone else. You are still prone to still do that which is not right. 
Yet I love you, Peter. Coming down to Peter's level, the level of his confession, Peter, now you know your own heart and I know your heart. Will you be my friend, Peter? Peter's words show deep penitence. Lord, you know all things. You know that I am your friend. He couldn't say any more than that. Couldn't go beyond that. I love you. Repentance is the sweet release of pride and sin. Don't be fooled by your own justification of your own deeds and actions. That you are above contradiction. So while it is still called today, repent. We think that repenting is a one-time deal at the start of our walk. But I can assure you, if we are not humbled and bear fruits worthy of repentance each day, we will find ourselves sheep without a flock, and shepherdless, and dare I say, lost in our sin, being disqualified from the life that is to come. Hebrews 3 7 reminds us, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. Hebrews 3 13. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Hebrews 3.15, while it is said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Again, Jesus commended, feed my sheep. We see that Peter has now been freely forgiven and restored to a place of usefulness. And Christ has commended to him the dearest thing that the Lord has on earth, his sheep, his people. I would like to ask you the same question. Do you love Jesus? You will surely answer, yes, I love him. All right. Do something about it. You can't possibly love anyone without wanting to do something for them. Do you love Jesus? then why not be faithful to the body of Christ, his people? Love them as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. As a man and wife, you forsake all others and you cleave to your wife. Forsaking all others so as to separate yourself from the world and be an integral part of the bride of Christ without spot or wrinkle. Don't tell me that you love Jesus when you can place earthly pursuits in place of fellowship. How can you use, how can you use for yourself that which belongs to him? Do you love Jesus? Then why do you not give your time and your money and your talents to the world when they could be used so wonderfully? For his glory. Do you love Jesus? Then why not take him everywhere you go? Why not live so that others will see Jesus in you? Why not love others and respect them as Jesus did? 
Why not try and win someone else to him if you love him? Oh, I tell you, friends, if everyone loved Jesus as Peter confessed and then went on to demonstrate how he loved the Lord, we'd have revival. Heaven would be in our hearts and we would no longer have room for the world. When we think of all he is and what he has done for us, what he has provided in the purposes of God, what he has saved us from and saved us out of, and what he has saved us for. When we think of all that, is, that he has done and is doing, even now around the world, we ought to love him above all else, above all that is in heaven or in earth below. Oh, how I love him. Oh, how I love Jesus. Remember that chorus? Remember if you remember another hymn. If I digress just for a minute. Let's sing together when it comes. Down from his glory. Ever living story. Down from his glory, ever living story, my God and Savior came, and Jesus was his name. Born in
Dare we say that we can do more than just strive for that which you've purposed in us. For Lord, we are all so often like Peter. Dare we think we're anything less than that. But Lord, your grace is sufficient for us. And Lord, when we recognize these things in our own hearts and lives, you, by your love and grace, reach down and you deal with us. Heavenly Father, you deal with us as children, for you love us. You admonish us to come home. You admonish us to draw closer. Discipline is always hard and correction difficult, but Lord, you... Chasten us because you love us. Complete your work in us, Lord, we pray. Oh, how I love him. Coming to our second point today. The death Jesus just assigned Peter the task of preaching the gospel. Now Jesus tells him that life for him is not going to be a bed of roses at all. Troubles will beset him on every side. And he will finally meet a violent death. If I'm speaking to some young person or those aspiring for any type of ministry... Someone contemplating an easy life as a preacher or a missionary or a Christian worker, let me tell you that you have a false notion of such a place and a position. Christ's servants never have an easy life at all. Not only are their lives filled with burdens and responsibilities such that no other men carry and which they can also never lay aside. But they also suffer criticism and persecution and false accusations. But that's to be expected. Here is what Jesus said. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Again he said, Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you, And shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. 34, 19, we read, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivered him out of them all. Peter once vowed that he would die a martyr's death. 
Now Jesus tells him that is exactly what he is going to do. He said that, he said, when you were young, you walked about, you went where you wanted to go. But when you are old, someone else will take you and carry you where you don't want to go. The writer of the Gospel, John, tells us that Jesus was speaking of the way that Peter would die, probably by crucifixion. Peter now can know what you and I know. We are safe in the hands of God. Death can't touch us until our time comes. David said, my times are in your hands. So if we meet death suddenly or in some other way, we can know that everything is all right if we belong to Jesus Christ. This will just be God's way of taking us to be with him. It is possible for us to glorify God in death, even as it is in life. Samson did more for God in his death than he did in his life, strangely enough. And we can glorify God in the way, in a way, in the way that we face death. We can glorify him by being ready for death, like a travelling man who is packed and his bags are ready and he's ready for his journey. We can glorify him by testifying to others of the comfort and grace that God is giving us by saying with David, I am walking through the valley of the shadow. But I will not fear no evil, for he is with me. Peter is to go on through life, serving God faithfully, yet knowing that a violent death is waiting for him. But he is to have no fear of death. For this will serve only to bring him once again face to face with his Saviour, the one he loves and has declared his love for him. Point three, the duty. Now Jesus says to Peter, follow thou me. He's simply saying your fishing days are over. You have a bigger job now. You are to walk in my ways and you are to serve me. You are to preach the gospel. You are to follow me wherever I lead you, even though it may be to prison and then death. Friends, this is the call for every one of us. Follow him. We are to follow him in faithful, active service and in consecrated Christian living. Peter showed he was still human. All right, Lord, I will follow you, but what about John? What's he going to do? Jesus redirected Peter's attention back to the Lord. What is that to you? You follow me. The issue is between you and God. The Bible tells us that every man and woman must give an account to God of himself and not of someone else. You can't stand before God and say, Lord, I didn't do my part because someone else didn't. He says to you now, what others do doesn't excuse you. Follow me. 1 Corinthians 3 Verse 11 through to chapter 4, verse 5 is a sobering passage for every believer as it brings into focus the fact that we individually will stand before Jesus and give an account for every word, every deed, every action we have ever done. That which we have done in the name of God and for God will be tried by fire. It is interesting what we justify, the Lord Jesus won't. The motive, the heart, we be proved for what it is. For in my flesh is no good thing. The Corinthians passage explaining to us what we build upon. 
Let's turn there briefly, shall we? 1 Corinthians 3. Verse 11, no other foundation can any, anyone lay than which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. We can't rip it up. We can't throw it out. When we build a house, the foundation must be true. And in the Christian life, it must be Christ. It can't be any other. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay or straw, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work for what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet as through fire. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the body, the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy. Which temple are you? Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He catches the wise in their craftiness. And again the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. Therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or the world or life or death, all things present or things to come, all are yours. And you are Christ's. And Christ is God's. Let a man so consider us servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. The continual working of the Christian life, consecrated life, a life that is walked the narrow path, not the wide, broad road to destruction, but narrow. Peter was worried about John. Jesus was worried about Peter. Worried. It's just the choice of words to explain the point. Jesus was never worried. Are we worried? Are we concerned for that which we are doing and being will, by God's grace, last so that we may present to him trophies of our life, trophies of those that we have shared the gospel with and that have been won into the kingdom? Sobering thoughts. The fourth and final point. The destiny. The book of the Acts, the next book in the Bible, the one that we have been considering before this message, tells us how faithfully Peter did follow Jesus. He became a preacher at Pentecost, a leader in the early church, a man who never turned back, a man who loved and served his Saviour until the end. Then came the day when Jesus' predictions came true. Peter was bound by an enemy of Christ and cruelly put to death. Yet in death, no more toil, no more trouble, no more sweat and tears, no more chains in prison for Peter, no more grief, no more disappointment. Instead, just the face of our Lord and soon returning King of Kings. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Friends, this light and momentary affliction is working for us such a greater weight of glory. 
I'm always moved when I read John 14. I would have to say that John is my favourite book because it declares the glory of Jesus Christ. He is set alone as deity, God come in the flesh like no other book has. Verse 1, chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, And the way you know, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Friends, our destiny isn't now. It isn't here. It is with him where Peter is, where we can ask him what what he did and how he did it. I think that will be really unimportant because all we want to find out is, Lord, how did you do it all? Why did you do it all? We will spend eternity trying to plumb the depths of the mystery of godliness and God himself. Don't set our hearts on things below. Set them on eternal things. Set them on him the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, the one that calls you and me, follow me. But the question has to be asked, do you love me more than these? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word again this morning. We thank you that it brings clarity to our so often grey mind where we are clouded with so many thoughts that pull us and distract us. But Lord, your word cuts through every thought and imagination of self and men and ideas. And Lord, you speak life. Where else can we go but you have the words of eternal life. We are stirred and moved again in your presence, Lord. We thank you for being with us. We thank you for your word that drives home that you are interested in each of our lives and that we must be careful with the time that we have to make our calling and election sure, to repent and to turn to you continually, not as a one-time event in our life and say, I've done with that. No, but live and bear fruits worthy of repentance walking circumspectly before you, allowing your life to be lived in and through us, that the glory of God may be seen. Now, Father, I pray for every heart and life here. If there is a one that is not born again by the Spirit of God, not one who has read the Bible and can quote Scripture and say things about it, but Lord, I'm saying born again by the Spirit of God, there has been a change, and in that change there's a turning There's a repentant heart that has been given over to the Lord. I pray, Lord, every heart here would make their peace with you this day. Don't let one escape, Lord. Arrest them, Lord, by the Spirit of God. Convict them of righteousness, of sin, and of judgment. For, Lord, you deserve the glory that you can get from a believer, a sinner that has been saved by your blood redeemed and set apart for your glory. Oh, how I love him. My breath, my strength, my sunshine, my all in all. The great creator became my saviour. Blessed be the Lord. Can you say that, friends, this morning? He is your saviour.